reception was not too long, uh, so that everybody's awake. Um, so uh, welcome to our first lecture. Our lecturer today is uh, Francesca Ferlaino, and she's going to explain us how quantum simulation works in practice. So um, very much looking forward to your lecture. Hello, so hi everybody, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, so uh, we will be together in the next couple of hours uh, and so um, I'm an experimentalist, uh, first of all. Uh, so I think that the high, are there any experimentalists in the audience? One, two, three, okay, really, let's say singularities, uh, I would say. And, uh, but so I, I, I was trying to go very slowly somehow and to give you some idea of what we are doing in our lab and what, what in general is related to, so what is really the meaning of quantum simulation, which I would say there is no strict definition in any sense, and uh, I will, uh, let's say, guide you a bit uh, on uh, what happens if, uh, you know, the platform, the architecture that you want to have for quantum simulation are uh, ultra-cold atoms. And in particular, I will show you, let's say in the first uh, part of the lecture, we will focus on the case uh, of, uh, you know, system uh, which are discrete. Uh, what do I mean? That there is, uh, you know, like a periodic structure and so make the simulation uh, in, uh, in terms of a uh, discrete Hamiltonian. But then in the second part, I will show you something which goes really a little bit beyond the simulation, but also not considering uh, the discrete, but more the continuous, because many, many systems in uh, nature are kind of have a continuous or a quasi-continuous structure, and of course the simulation in the continuum is somehow uh, more tough, more difficult, okay? Uh, and the reason for that in general uh, is that, um, let's say, the particle moves. While the, the idea of having a discretization is also the idea to impose, a, uh, let's say, a structure in space, uh, and if we want even to switch off uh, the external degree of freedom, meaning the degree of freedom of the motion. This make, you, make your life easier because kinetic energy play an extremely small uh, to negligible uh, effect because they kind of are pinned. And, uh, but there is a, the internal degree of freedom can evolve. Uh, for internal degree of freedom, we always mean what is the internal state of a particle, like what is the spin state, and this can evolve. If you go to, uh, if you allow particle to move, uh, then you have to consider in a discrete system uh, tunneling, uh, but still in the discrete system, this tunneling you can, you know, control, uh, is under control, while in a bulk, uh, where there is no external, uh, you know, ordering imposed, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, much more difficult. You start to even have a particle that move in a reservoir, and this reservoir can be Marconian or non-Marconian, and I think that there it's much more needed, uh, you know, new, appro new theoretical approach uh, to, uh, you know, find out what is going on. So we go now to the part which is, uh, um, let's say, the... the um, you know, the discrete part of the lecture. And as you will see, we have some introductory that are really very basic. I heard yesterday at lunch that there are even postdoc or more advanced people in the audience. So, okay, will be boring maybe at the beginning for you, but uh, if you resist, then at some point something will become more uh, at your level. So, okay, let's get started. And of course, this doesn't work. Yeah, so first of all, I mean, uh, everybody is telling, okay, so what is quantum simulation? So the, ge the most general definition that you can have uh, is still, I mean, somehow very deep uh, if we want to think about this. Uh, but I don't know why it doesn't work, actually. Do you have a pointer? Ah, yeah, no, it seems working. Okay, so the, the, the really zero order definition is that you want to, so you have a very complicated system made of many, many, many particles, and then uh, you would like to mimic uh, the behavior of a complicated system to the behavior of something easier. And now the problem is that you would say, okay, but that's, uh, you are not allowed to do because you have a complicated system, why a simple one should, you know, teach you something on the complicated system. And here come really the idea 
idea of quantum simulation because you can have complicated or easy system, but if they follow the same you know, equation of motion, then you can simulate one of the other. If they follow the same Hamiltonian or very similar Hamiltonian, then you can simulate, mimic, reflect one system to the other. And so that's the, the key idea of this. And then uh, to try also to kind of narrow down the definition of which system to really something which is physical relevant. So typically quantum simulation at the beginning, uh, which was really uh, almost more than 20 years ago, started with the idea to have a complex uh, relevant problem of physics uh, and whose solution was unknown, and to use, you know, let's say, really laboratory experiment to mimic and to learn something. And so what I like always to show is a really a stupid a graphical idea of what is uh, the concept of quantum simulation, okay? So you, you have something which is complicated, okay? And uh, that's your target. You would like to, you know, learn about the behavior of this dragon, and the dragon is, uh, you know, difficult, you cannot uh, go too close to the dragon, it's too dangerous, uh, and it's something really uh, that, 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 that you cannot approach directly. And so the simulation will look at this dragon very carefully and try to put together the ingredient that defines the dragon. And so one in ingredient is like, okay, maybe that's kind of more, more or less the shape of the body of my dragon, and this I can study, it's not so dangerous. And then I need to give the wings to my dragon, and then I need to give uh, you know, the corn. And somehow the, this part is very important. And that's the part of identifying the key properties of the dragon or the key properties of the system that we would like to simulate. And then based on these key properties, we will you know, get a new system that maybe it's artificial, we engineer, because this system does not exist in nature. So it's an engineer, that is an artificial quantum matter in this sense, in the sense that we isolate the key properties and then based on the key properties, we create an artificial quantum system that is you know, similar to the natural one. And then we notice that maybe the equation of motion of this you know, new object are very similar to our target. That's the philosophy of what, I mean, really quantum simulation is about, okay? And uh, in general, uh, which are the topics, uh, I mean, uh, that are relevant for quantum simulation? So originally, the motivation was really to study solid state system. I mean, in a solid state system, you know better than me, it are extremely important because it really many devices around us are solid state. It's very important because electricity is very important. The electron, how do the electron move in a solid state are very important. The electron are really many, many, many. Uh, there are kind of complex dynamics because on the, uh, you have the ion and the ion can arrange in space uh, let's say making different band structure and the electron should move and maybe they get trapped and there is the electron-electron interaction, there are the ion-electron interaction and all this made this problem quite complex and moreover, it's very hard, I mean, you cannot really follow totally deterministically let's say, the behavior of one electron among the many, okay? And so the original uh, really, and the first experiment uh, that have been done in the, in the direction of quantum simulation, and the first proposal was really about quantum material simulation. So, and there you have a very important problem which can be high temperature superconductor or even frustrated quantum magnet, strange metal, spin glasses. Those are all example of physical problem, I would say, uh, that, um, are very hard to compute and they're very hard to understand in real condensed matter solid state physics. Now, so some of these have still very big open question like high temperature superconductor is still an open question in the field why, I mean, uh, 
there is high temperature superconductivity, progress have been made continuously, uh, but still the really underlying reason is that it's hidden, we don't know. As well, frustration is really a problem because, I mean, it's frustration is this very simple example of having, you know, a triangular lattice and you have, you know, a spin up, a spin down, which spin will have the third one. Now, that's the really most simple idea of what does frustration would mean uh, in the sense that uh, um, you get in a situation in which the system doesn't know where to evolve in some sense. Now, really said from very basic point of view. And then you have the strange metal, uh, which is one part of the phase diagram, very important as well, and uh, the sp spin glasses. But of course, I mean, over the year, so to requiring uh, to, uh, the, let's say, quantum simulate this problem, uh, it's, um, it's challenging, and it was particularly relevant because electrons are fermions, and when you try to compute uh, many, many fermions, there is really uh, a problem to find an efficient simulation uh, due to the sign problem associated with the fermion statistic, but it's also challenging in general to think about the spin frustration or to compute complex gauge field, okay? But then uh, the, the, the field also moved to other topic. Uh, one, for example, is really the quantum chemistry to simulate uh, complex uh, um, chemistry uh, reaction, uh, which are in the quantum regime, let's say very low temperature or single molecule and complex molecule. And then it moved also to, uh, let's say, try to understand transport in a m more broader sense uh, in all what are the device, the quantum device for transport, a guideline, a restricted dimension, having, you know, really very thin wire that goes, I mean, in bit, so let's say uh, th that challenge a bit the size uh, the, the point spread function of an atom with the size of the channel and uh, having more complex uh, uh, structure. Of course, another very open at the moment, which is in the quantum simulation, I would say one main trend of today quantum simulation is to understand the concept of uh, thermalization. So, or in general, how do a quantum system, so made of many particles which follow uh, equation of law which are kind of Hamiltonian, would then, uh, you know, go, if, if you put it out of equilibrium, what will happen to this system? Will this stay, if it's isolated, will the system be forever out of equilibrium? Will this uh, pre-thermalize? Uh, what is the, the, let's say, really the fate of the non-equilibrium quantum many body uh, system? That's a very important uh, uh, topic of research. I mean, there was some consolidated understanding on the equilibrium phases uh, of uh, lattice uh, system, and now much more open question are in the non-equilibrium sector. And then we can really make really a leap, a jump, so we can go to something which is completely uh, far away from, let's say, the very low energy. We can, I mean, we typically quantum simulate with ultra-cold atom, and ultra-cold means energy in the regime of pico-electron volt. And now we could think even uh, to, you know, to say something about uh, cosmology, particle physics, uh, gravity, so to go even in regime which can be mega electron volt or regime which can be kilo electron volt or uh, let's say astrophysical relevant question. And about the astrophysical relevant question in the second part of my lecture, I will give you a very precise example of what we can do. Uh, what are, okay, those are kind of the big, uh, I would say, topic that one can address or would like to address with quantum simulation. But then there is another point, I mean, which are the platform. And now for platform, it's uh, getting very popular, the word architecture. So how do you architect many body system and what are the nature of the, you know, component that will then allow you to, you know, unlock an Hamiltonian, unlock a dynamics and study. So there have been, I mean, in my, so I'm more in the field of, you know, single uh, atom molecule, okay? And in this domain, what you have, you can uh, make quantum simulation with a molecule, with ultra-cold molecule, or you can take tr ultra-cold trapped ion, okay? This is a, a platform also very much, uh, uh, that very much initiated somehow part of the quantum computing, uh, let's say, pillar of, 
of science, but then you have ultra cold atom, which are really kind of a very easy native system for quantum simulation. And more recently, there have been a new technique in, let's say, te technological development of creating very tiny thin trap, which are extremely focused. Each of these trap is independent, and there's a very, very, very narrow focus, so you can have exactly one atom per uh, trap, and this trap is called a tweezer, just to highlight the fact that it's a dipole trap, highly focused. It's nothing else, a tweezer is nothing else than a tightly focused dipole trap. And it's so tightly focused that you have just few atom per lattice side, and then you have to know your molecular physics to go from the few atom to a single atom and do a pair projection. And so, and now those are kind of the platform for which every, kind of every week there are, you know, advancement of how fine the control can be. But of course, there are also more complex uh, structure in which you have maybe particle and then you couple this atom together with something else. For example, you can enter in a regime of extremely, extremely strong atom light coupling such that your final state is not an atom, is not a photon, is, you know, hybridized between an atom and photon. And this is all what it's the physics uh, uh, really of of studying a few atoms or many atoms in cavities, because the cavities, you know, amplify the effect of the light on the atom, and you get this uh, highly dressed state or, an, or even entanglement between light and the atom. And of course, then we can go more in the solid state part, and you can create really uh, nanostructure, solid state nanostructure, and have photon in a nanostructure. And then, I mean, uh, there is uh, all the other bunch of study uh, in quantum simulation that is really related to uh, solid state system, for example, a superconducting quantum circuit, but that's not the only one. You will hear more in your school. I'm not an expert. You can have quantum dot devices, uh, color center, van der Waals center structure moiré material where you can, you know, tilt the plane and, uh, and uh, several exciton. Hmm? So those are the architecture, and uh, in this talk, I will mainly focus on you know, ultra-cold neutral atom, okay, to give you this uh, example, but also in my lab, uh, we have a Rydberg atom array, but I will uh, not really cover this part. Okay, so now if we go here, let's give uh, uh, the keywords. Uh, the keywords uh, uh, are ultra-cold atom, uh, you have an optical lattice, uh, and then the Hamiltonian. So, and, uh, and somehow, in general, I already pointed out that even a problem like this one, let's say small amount of atom in a square lattice, uh, to have the exact diagonalization of the Hamiltonian governing uh, even a small system is extremely challenging. And, uh, and it's very high, hard to make really, let's say, precise, uh, uh, let's say, physical uh, uh, prediction, uh, because the computational time is growing exponentially with the size of the particle, so with how many particles you have. This you know very well and much better than me, but this is really a problem. And so the solution was, okay, let's make in the experiment bigger system, and let's see, you know, what is the result uh, of the experiment, okay? And uh, the first uh, application of this idea of quantum simulation was accounting for a simple uh, Hamiltonian. We will look at this Hamiltonian a bit more in the few, in few slides, in which you have actually basically a 2D lattice, and then you have one atom per lattice side, and this atom can tunnel, and here the tunneling is J, and once it tunnels, you can have two atoms in one lattice side which have interaction. Okay, but in this Hamiltonian, there is no off or let's say off-site interaction. So one atom placed here will not interact with an atom here. Okay, so it's really, let's say, the minimal model that you can have to study, you know, transport of electron or a particle in a periodic structure, okay? Uh, the difference from single atom is just the, pro the possibility that this particle, when moving, can interact with other particles. And this interaction already creates, uh, even, 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 even if it's weak, uh, creates very interesting new phase. So now we have these three ingredients, uh, and the aim here now is to go one by one and say just a little bit about one by one, but also with, uh, you know, a bit more um, a fresh look on the new trend. 
So I will start with the optical lattices and I will give you some basic concept of optical lattices. Why it's important or particularly important for you that there are theories to know something on the optical lattices? Because this will tell you, let's say, which are the, you know, the relevant problem that we in the experiment can actually, uh, you know, uh, benchmark with the theory. Okay, so many, mm, and not everything is possible in the experiment, uh, and it's much more possible than what we know today, but first we need to know the basic, okay? So the basic concept of optical lattices are very, uh, let's say, you know, it's kind of atom-light interaction in a, a very, you know, moderate regime. So if you have an atom and you shine light on this atom, the atom polarizes itself. So there is a quantity always um, uh, indicated with alpha, which is called the atomic polarizability. Now, depending on the wavelengths of your laser, the coupling of the atom to the light uh, have a different strength. So the polarizability the, and these strengths, uh, which is proportional to the electric dipole moment, okay? Uh, this quantity here is dependent on the wavelength of your laser, which now I put it in energy, but it's, let's say, 2 pi divided by lambda, okay? And so this is really then the polarizability at the frequency omega, and then uh, this polarizability has to be uh, multiplied by the electric field. Okay, that's the first important thing, y square. So why it's not linear in electric field uh, beside, uh, you know, dimension, why it's quadratic. Proportion to the intensity as a consequence of being quadratic, but why it's quadratic? Is there, you know, you have atom, light, they couple, and then you get, you know, the dipole potential, which is really the potential C by the atom. And actually, because a neutral atom doesn't have uh, an electric dipole moment alone in the dark, doesn't have an electric dipole moment, okay? Then it means uh, that when you add light, uh, the zero order stark shift uh, is zero, okay? So this, the, the square here tells you that this coupling is second order perturbation theory, as simple as that. So it means that it has first to induce and then to create the potential. So there is two steps, okay? The light trap, but the light induce an electric dipole moment. The polarizability to polarize the electron cloud around, okay? And so that's why it's a square. There is only one possibility to have linear. Do you know when? So linear stark shift for neutral atom. This is when you use degenerate perturbation theory and you have two energy levels which are degenerate to each other. You need to use the general perturbation theory which give you the first term in perturbation, okay? Those are neutral atom. Neutral atom don't have a permanent electric uh, uh, dipole moment. It's very different in other systems. Let's say, for example, ion. That's very different, okay? Uh, and then <clears throat> this electric field, uh, why do I put time average over an electric field? Well, this because the electric field, let's say, is a wave. The wave oscillates very fast. I mean, you might wonder what's the value of omega. Is omega hertz, kilohertz, you know? How fast the electric field is oscillating? How big is this omega? This omega typically is tera. Terahertz. So it's oscillating extremely fast over the time scale of anything an atom can do, okay? So that's why it's always the, the, the atom is seeing always something which is really kind of time average in omega, okay? And so what do you create? That's the dipole trap. I mean, with this simple, uh, then it's depend on the form of the electric field, okay? If you have a simple Gaussian beam, uh, then the potential that you will have is simply a dipole trap, an harmonic potential, okay? It's one laser beam is focused, and at the focus, uh, I mean, the atom can be at the focus for, blue det uh, for red detuned light, and you get uh, a dipole potential. 
But of course, you can do a little bit more. You can take your Gaussian beam, put a mirror, and you retroreflect. Then you have an incoming wave. It's retroreflected on a, on a mirror, goes back. This creates interference, and so that's how we create standing wave. Okay, that's simply your Gaussian beam retroreflected on a mirror and going back, create this standing wave. Now, interesting, uh, let's say tricky, uh, let's say nomenclature things. This one is one di dimensional lattice, so you have one beam all in one direction, but here, all these disks are two dimensional system. So if you want to create a two-dimensional system, you can uh, think about, you know, uh, I don't know, a, a salami and cutting slice, uh, then every slice is a two-dimensional. And there you can have 10 to the 4 atom, many atom, not single atom, okay? So one delete is create two-dimensional system. Uh, of course, you can have not only one standing wave, you can have two, and so then you can create uh, actually tube. Or you can have three standing waves and you get more into the crystal structure. So why this is important, you see immediately the analogy. You, know, you have a real crystal, you have the ion, the ion are very, very heavy. There is a factor of four in mass between the ion and the electron, typically. And so it means that the ion all, you can consider almost as a frozen. It's not frozen, you know there is phonon. Okay, but then uh, you can see it in first approximation of stationary ion and then the valence electron that move in this periodic potential. And in the optical lattice you have the same. So you have a stationary standing wave that is quite stiff and then uh, your atom, neutral atom can move. And this atom can be either bosons or fermions because you can do ultra cold atom of both isotopes, of different isotopes. What are the advantages, I mean, uh, with respect to, you know, in between these two, that's, let's say, the first ingredient that we, we said we want to find the, the ingredient, and that's a very important ingredient. We have now an optical lattice is mimicking, simulating the stationary ion. And so you can have a simple lattice geometry. One thing that at the beginning was uh, sell it uh, as an added value and now is a limitation is that this lattice is perfect. Why it's a limitation? Because in real system, the lattice is never perfect. So you would like to, you know, add phonon excitation of your lattice. You would like to add impurities, and this is getting very challenging, okay? But at the beginning, the idea that there was no defect, no phonon, no charge, were all a simplification for, you know, basic, minimal Hamiltonian model. And then you can control many things. You can control the lattice step, so how are we really making the tunneling zero by increasing a lot the, the lattice step or not just by working on the power of your laser. It's really trivial. And, uh, and you can also, and we will see more, uh, work about the geometry. Like, uh, you know, in real crystal, the crystalline structure can be very different. You know, there are several Breve lattices. Uh, I think there are kind of 14 Breve lattices in three dimensions or a number like of this order of magnitude. Uh, so you can create many different uh, crystals. But also what is cool in cool cold atom, which is not really possible here, so you can go now a step farther, is we can tune the interaction between the atom. So this quantity U can be, um, and then there is all the quest of probing the state. Uh, which I will tell you later. So what about, I mean, the geometry? I mean, so far I just show you the idea that you have a laser beam like Gaussian, then you have a mirror, this reflect, go back, and this is the type of potential we have. You see that there is also, uh, typically, and this is not very nice in the experiment, we try to compensate, there is also, let's say, is the lattice on top of an harmonic potential because of, you know, the Gaussian profile in the other two directions. Uh, so those are kind of, the lattice spacing is the wavelengths of the laser divided by two in this configuration, and that's it. But actually you can change the lattice spacing because if you don't retroreflect really counter-propagating, but you have two beam at an angle, they will also create interference where they you know, where they cross, and this uh, lattice spacing can become bigger. 
You cannot make it smaller, that's the minimal lattice spacing that you can create with a given lambda, but you can make it bigger. And so the lattice spacing I would go as, a, you know, independence of this angle theta here. Okay, it's cosine of theta. But also what you can do, very interesting, you can make it moving. Okay, like rigidly moving the lattice. How do you do this? Well, you fix a, a given uh, frequency of a laser, and the other laser, if you make a small change of the frequency, so you go from the first, uh, you know, the zero order plus, you know, you give a small uh, shift, uh, then this will be a traveling uh, uh, wave uh, which follow this rule here. So you can make it moving. Okay, but not moving locally, moving globally, which is the problem of the phonon. Yes? Okay, so um, controlling the angle is rather simple because I can, you know, sim I mean, there are many mm, different ways I can do that. Uh, so mm, there are uh, objects uh, in the experiment which is called uh, very, which they are very useful, and those are called uh, acoustic optic modulator AOM. So you can have uh, this device which is the AOM, and then you can have one beam going here. So you enter with your laser, and then uh, you can have another one, which is zero order, first order, which is a shift in frequency. Then I can put a lens, I make these two like this, okay? And then uh, what I can do, I can kind of uh, change uh, here. And so this make me changing uh, the distance of these two beam. And then, uh, you know, I can put a kind of uh, two mirror, and then they go to the atom, and by this I can adjust. That's, for example, something easy. And uh, how precise, I mean, yeah, it really depends on, uh, so there is no lower bound in some sense, okay? You can be certainly precise at the level of few lambda of your wavelength. So certainly you can be sub-micron precision if you do the things correctly. Okay, that's about, okay, having always a square lattice uh, and you are changing the spacing, uh, so you made, uh, let's say, the, the, the lattice side, uh, la, let's say the lattice spacing bigger or smaller in a given geometry, and, uh, but of course there is other degree of freedom. So the complexity can always be increased. One other uh, properties that light has is polarization, okay? So we have not yet worked on the polarization so far. We said lambda, we said what is really the geometry of the angle, but not the polarization. The polarization is, is you know, how the electric field oscillate with respect to a quantization axis. And then I can have my simple uh, square lattice in 2D, that's really two-dimensional. Square lattice, I just put, you know, uh, orthogonal couple of light, and then I get the simple, uh, let's say, 2D version. But actually, I could also work uh, with the, uh, independently with the polarization of laser one and laser two. And if I do this, uh, I can actually have to account uh, on the uh, phase, okay, between the different sending waves. They kind of, yeah, I can play with kind of the phase, so the delay of the single standing wave. And, uh, and by playing with this, I can get many different lattice potential, okay? And, uh, and some uh, different geometry, I can have a minimum or I can have a maximum, I can create something like this. And also, so far we all only get, okay, we get uh, same lambda, can play with the polarization of each of the beam, but each beam comes from the same laser, but I could also make interference beam with different wavelengths. And then I could create, for example, super lattice, in which I combine a set beam with different lattice. And then you can see, you can create all this type of, uh, you know, little plaquette where you have two atoms here, then they are very well separated by the next, uh, you know, dimer, uh, system. So 
So you have kind of two atom plaqueta, which are uh, sometimes called the dimer. And then you can also, you know, play around. You can even create a two well potential, and you can play around uh, to make this more washboard in one direction, and you can juggle with the atom somehow. This is all what you can do if you have two uh, wavelengths. And then there is even something more, because you can have, uh, uh, let's say, you can combine more than two lasers, and if you combine more than two lasers in this uh, different direction, you can really go to a uh, different type of geometry, like triangular, or honeycomb, or 1D chain, and play around as you want. And of course, uh, let's say the triangular is a very interesting uh, let's say, setting uh, for, uh, let's say, Hamiltonian. And so here, it's another example of using three beam of let, uh, typical lattice potential that you can use, like uh, this triangular, or you can even have an uh, hexagonal lattice uh, that you create again with three beam, uh, but playing with their polarization. Okay, and now you have this nice hexagonal lattice. And so suddenly, you can uh, study physics of graphene using ultra-cold atom, huh? because that's the geometry, the underlying geometry of, uh, of graphene. Okay, but, and then there is also another, you know, uh, level of tunability or level that, uh, of complexi complexity that we can go on. Now, just uh, take, take in mind that the dipole potential was the atomic polarizability and the electric field, okay? So far, I told you, with the electric field, I can have more than one electric field. Each of these can have different polarizability, can have different wavelengths, and I can send them on different geometry. So I, I show you example of tunability of the laser, let's say the electric field. What about the atomic polarizability, okay? So, so far we treat it as a number. And in the majority of cases, is a number. Let's say you say, okay, the cap at these wavelengths, the coupling uh, of an atom with the light is 100 atomic unit. That's uh, uh, the, the thing. But in reality, the polarizability is a much more complex function. And so this opens a new door, and this new door is very little explored so far. Now it's starting a little bit. I, you will see why now it's starting. Because indeed, uh, the, the polarizability is not a function of a single value, is a matrix, okay? Is a tensor, and, is a, a, and that's very important that one understand that that's a tensor. And so the fact that it's a tensor is a new degree of, pol a new degree of tunability. And which type of tensor? Well, in general, this function, um, which is, I mean, explicitly relevant when you have an anisotropic media, always in an isotropic medium, the, the index of reflection of an anisotropic medium is a tensor. You can think about atom in the same way. Complex electronic structure, not spherical, are like an isotropic medium. Any, every atom, because the polarizability is a single atom properties, okay? Every one atom are identical, okay? But each, the alpha is a single atom properties. Okay, has nothing to do with interaction. It doesn't change if it's alone or you have many atoms around. Now, it tells you the index of reflection of the medium single atom. Okay, if your medium single atom is anisotropic because the electronic cloud around the core is not spherical, then it's very relevant to have tensor. How can you have non-spherical uh, electronic configuration? or when the electronic configuration is, is spherical. We go back really from basic atomic physics. Eh? S wave. S is very good. Yes, wave, not so much, it's orbital. S orbital, okay? So it's really atomic, you need, if you do, let's say, atomic physics, uh, for quantum science, you need to know the atomic physics and the quantum science, which sometimes is a little bit challenging. But you need to use the in and properties of a single atom to, you know, uh, make new architecture. So if you have a hydrogen or any alkali, this is a class of atom which has how many valence electrons? 
in the ground state. One. So you have whatever core, we don't care, and one valence electron, we care about this electron. This electron move around the core and it can move in different way. Ground state alkali, which is the main atomic species used in 98% of the experiment around the world, has a, an electronic configuration which is, okay, the core of a noble gas plus something which is an S state. It's always S. Okay, the orbital here, depending on which one, and this is normally this, is always an S orbital. It means that the electron move in a sphere. Huh? So it's kind of completely spherical symmetric. But if you now have atoms which don't have an S but have more complex, huh? then the situation changes. Okay, you can have maybe electron that move in a D, you see now, this is an isotropic. That's the geometry of a D wave, D orbital. And so on and so forth. So this is a medium which is an isotropic. For this medium, the polarizability is actually a tensor. And that's kind of very important. Okay? Now, in general, let's don't think about this. In general, how can we decompose this matrix? There are three parts. One is the scalar one. That's the only one really relevant for alkali and for what I told you so far is a number. But then there is another contribution that we call vectorial and there is another contribution that we call tensorial. Although all this is a tensor, we give this name. How does it look like? Well, unfortunately, I should have used another color. Uh, but somehow it's kind of a complex, start to become a complex function, but we can see something. This first term here is the number, is one number, is the scalar one. Then this is, let's say, the vectorial contribution and that's the tensorial contribution. Now the vectorial contribution depends on an angle, so an isotropy always bring angle into the problem, and it's the angle between the quantization axis and the wave vector of the beam that propagate. And then there is this tensorial one that you see here. It's very interesting because it depends on, a, a, let's say, the spin state of your atom and the, the Zeeman sublevel is occupying. And there is also an angle dependent. And this angle dependence is, uh, uh, let's say, depending on the quantization axis and uh, the polarization of your light. So these are, uh, allows you this formula to create lattices uh, uh, which are different for different spin state. So you know one part of uh, all the solid state is to study spin dynamics uh, and you can create a, a situation in which one spin, let's say the spin up, uh, see a lattice and move in this up, the spin down, see another lattice or maybe see no lattice and make a reservoir like a Marconi, no, non Marconi reservoir, okay? Those are all possible as a degree. Okay, and so this is uh, uh, something new because now you will see uh, later that there are more and more atoms which are becoming popular in our field which have a very anisotropic electronic. So there is, a, let's say, an orbital anisotropy. Now, basic concept of Hamiltonian, I mean, since you are theorists, I will go very fast. I mean, it's all what you know much better than me. And, uh, okay, let's go. I already told you why, let's say, we want to simulate, for example, quantum material, and I already told you why, so where, where the analogies c come from, no? You have the, the localized electron and you have a localized core, and here for the model you can, uh, you know, have uh, atoms uh, in optical uh, lattices. And uh, so when you think about the model, I think you have uh, uh, the one starting interesting model are the family of Hubbard model and you have the Fermi Hubbard and the Bose Hubbard. In the experiment we can access both uh, because I mean we have fermions or uh, bosons and um, they look like uh, more or less pretty much like this for the bosons. You have the field operator and there is an interaction term uh, which is a number in many cases. And then, uh, okay, so that's the kinetic energy, the external potential that in our case is just a periodic potential. And then you have a term uh, with, uh, let's say, field operator that tells you about the interaction. 
Now, how the first simplification that typically we consider from this equation is to, uh, let's say, uh, replace uh, or develop the field operator. So we can, uh, we explicitly put in uh, the lattice potential, which is, okay, periodic. As you can have periodic potential plus even something else, like a broad harmonic, uh, if it's needed. And then uh, you can expand the field operator in the Vanier basis uh, that, I mean, I don't think I need in this audience explain a lot, but every field operator can be, so those are the Vanier uh, uh, function. And, um, and then you can rewrite uh, uh, after this expansion uh, the parameter here. You can you know, de decompose the parameter and then it come out uh, a part which is a tunneling J which is uh, connected to the kinetic energy and the periodic potential. Note this J, in my approximation, is uh, only a single particle term. Okay, it's the kinetic energy of a single particle. This single particle see a periodic potential. It's not a two-body tunneling. It's not correlated. So the tunneling happens equally whether you have other atom or not. This is an approximation because in reality, in the real Hamiltonian, that's, I mean, in the real system, it's much more interesting than this. But those were the minimal um, model uh, accounted at the beginning. And then uh, you can uh, rewrite the um, interaction. I mean, uh, now the interact one uh, key point when you work with ultra cold atom that defined the success of the system at the beginning is that the interaction at very low temperature between uh, ultra cold atom, it's, uh, especially if you have uh, S and alkali, it's uh, very simple. It's basically the interaction is a delta function, okay? And this delta function, um, it's multiplied by one parameter, which is called a scattering lens. How do I understand it? It's really almost mean field. Uh, it's kind of really somehow classical. Because if you have, uh, so what does the contact interaction tells you? You take a two billiard ball, you make them colliding. That's the delta function. So if the billiard ball are here, they don't see each other. We agree on that. But they have to do the scattering, so the collision scattering, interaction are kind of all synonymous, okay? And then they go out. And so that's this, the, the meaning of the scattering lens. But then you, would, you should answer, ask yourself, okay, if this is the intuition of the scattering lens, how the scattering lens can be different between atoms? Okay, you can understand that if the billiard ball have a different mass, then probably the scattering, it's different, but there is something more. How can I tune this? And actually here it comes um, the point uh, of really, let's say, having the quantum version of the scattering. And the quantum version is the following. I have two atoms. They don't do this, they do this, they become molecule, brrr, stay a little bit, they feel the molecular potential. They are asking themselves, should I become a molecule or should I exit as two atom? That's what is happening and going out. This uh, moment where they are deciding what to do, where they feel the molecular potential, give a delay. Because, I mean, maybe the two of them can be very fast, no delay, they arrive very quickly. But then there might be others that stay a lot more. These give a delay, the delay give a phase. The phase difference of the incoming and the outcoming is the scattering length. The limit of the phase difference for low momentum, that's the definition, is the scattering length. I want to give you, because you are theorists, I want to give you the experimental definition of things, the intuition of things. That's the intuition of the scattering lens. Another intuition, and uh, how can I formalize this uh, a little bit better? It's the following. I have an atom in an atomic level with energy one. I have another atom with another atomic level, two. Let's say this can be the same, two identical atoms, same energy. Then I kind of uh, plot the energy level, which is the sum of A1 plus A2. 
If I do this, I'm considering that the atoms are very far away. They don't cross. It's just the sum of the single. But when they approach each other, they start to do this stuff. So they feel the molecular potential. This is the van der Waals. This is R, the distance between the atoms, where they are very different, it's just the sum. When they approach the field, the molecular potential. And this is the molecular potential. OK? How it's like this? Two um, independent atoms, that's the sum of the two hyperfine energy. Then here, it's what it's called the van der Waals part, which typically goes like 1 over r to the 6. It goes to the minimum, and this is the hard wall that you put because the atom cannot compenetrate one to each other. Okay, So there is a repulsion. More close, they cannot get. It's a hard wall. And in this potential, you see the parabola in first approximation. You have all the energy level of the molecule. This is a molecule. These are two atoms together. It's a molecule. These are two atoms. That's a, what it's called the atomic threshold. The wave function of two atoms, how is that? The wave function of two atoms, no molecule, two atoms, is fast oscillation with low probability. That's the wave function of the two atoms. They feel here the potential. When they arrive at short range, they what should they do, what should they do? And they feel all this. The, the uh, number of oscillation, the height of oscillation of this wave function depend on the form of this potential. And the scattering length is the two atoms enter, stay here, go out, and have a phase shift. OK? And that they stay here inside, it's depending on uh, the potential. How do I change? Uh, I mean, if I have only one potential, I cannot change too much. They go, that's the potential given by whatever, and uh, that's it. Uh, it's really determined by a single atom. But if I have two potential, I can take this one, and I can bring it down with magnetic field, uh, because maybe the Zeeman energy are different. The shift is different. And effectively, I can do something like this. I can make that my level here, it's very close to another level. So they think, oh my god, it's really super nice to be together. Because now there is an le energy level of the molecule very close. I stay longer, the phase shift increase. That's a bit the, the, the point of view. OK? More or less. And uh, yeah. And this is about the scattering lens of the problem, <clears throat> to give you an intuition. So if we need, uh, let's say, really scattering a molecular potential. We need very, co to get the precise form of this potential is extremely complex. Uh, molecular physicists, uh, chemistry need to help us. There is a Benicio calculation for the molecular potential. This is another degree of complexity. But somehow, at the end of the day, we just want to know what is the phase shift. It's a number, scattering lens. And we want to learn how to tune it. When this molecular state gets in resonance with the atomic level, that's the point where we call, we have a so-called flashback resonance. The phase shift uh, diverge because they really would like to stay together. It costs no energy to become a molecule. Okay, so then uh, the phase shift, uh, the delay increase a lot. Okay, and that's uh, about the term. And now, if we do this expansion in the Vanier basis, we have this new Hamiltonian with the operator A, Daga, and A. So that's the single particle tunneling. That's, that's the two-body interaction, and then this is an energy, the chemical potential. Okay, so you can have the tunneling, as we said. You can have the interaction when two atoms sit on the same lattice side, and we have maybe this external potential that give you a shift of the chemical potential, a shift of the low uh, point. This model is minimal. I mean, it's really the minimal interesting model, I would say, but there are a number of approximations. First of all, I already mentioned one. There is no interaction between atoms sitting in two lattice side, two different lattice side. There is no tunneling uh, going over two lattice sides, so no next near neighbor tunneling. Uh, there are no higher band. I mean, if you think about this as a small harmonic potential, you have different harmonic level. 
but all this physics tells you that if you are in the lowest energy level of this kind of harmonic potential, you do tunneling and you remain there. So there is no higher block band into the problem. Hmm? And then uh, you have uh, this uh, simply uh, non-regularized uh, pseudo potential for uh, the interaction. Okay. So, but already this minimal potential gives us something very interesting, it has an hidden phase transition that you know very well, which is the superfluid to mott insulator phase transition. So, if you want to study the ground state, and this tells you that you want to reconstruct the phase diagram, which are the possible state phase, it's a synonymous. Uh, so you will have the superfluid where you have particle, each particle is delocalized, each particle is identical to the other, and so they are fully phase coherent. Okay, so you can see this as a matter wave uh, fully coherent. Okay, so it's a the particles are delocalized, there is no excitation gap, okay, and it's a coherent phase. Here the tunneling is much higher than the, um, than the interaction energy. At, I mean, it's easy to delocalize and you can, instead of uh, really, you have block function, uh, delocalized over uh, the real space. And then you have the Mott insulator, which is, uh, let's say, the same Hamiltonian, but if your parameter, the tunneling, is much, much reduced, so you really are increasing the height of the potential, okay? And in this case, uh, you have a particle which are more localized. At some point, you lose the phase coherence because they cannot really speak to each other anymore, and there is an excitation gap, okay? So the Mott phase is a gapped phase. And now the phase diagram look like this one. On the one hand, uh, this, this is the control parameter, is J divided by U. As we said, uh, if uh, J divided by U is very big, you're always in the superfluid phase. But once you are decreasing, uh, if you now move by decreasing J, you enter for a given number of uh, particle, which is embedded in the chemical potential, you enter in the first lobe, as it's called, in which you have a Mott insulator with exactly one particle per lattice side. If you increase the atom number, you go from uh, one particle to two particles, like here in this sketch, okay? And so what you would be able to reconstruct is this type of wedding structure in which you have now, this is the um, uh, superfluid, uh, then uh, you enter in the first uh, Mott insulator lobe or wedding cakes uh, layer, and then in the second one here, it's where you have two atoms, and in between you go back to the superfluid state. And these have been uh, observed, and uh, how these can be observed? Well, you can use, uh, you see, those are ma many different properties, uh, so you can observe this superfluid to Mott insulator looking at one property that dramatically change. One is phase coherent, and the other one is non-phase coherence. And when I told you that's matter wave, as soon as you heard the word wave, what do you think? Well, wave can interfere. And it's very easy for you to understand that the interference of something which is coherent, so each wave at the same phase, or something in which each wave has a random phase, it's very different. No? And so in the case of uh, the superfluid, uh, then you can see each of your atom as a little matter wave, uh, and then this little matter wave is interfering uh, like, you know, a slit uh, with the other matter wave. And so in momentum, uh, uh, so which you can uh, do by Fourier transforming if you are a theorist, uh, or you can do by waiting a lot of this expansion, a lot of time in this expansion, and you are in the momentum space, uh, what you see, you see an interference pattern. If you repeat this measurement a hundred times, you will always get the same interference pattern. The fact that it's same interference pattern for different realization tells you that it's the robustness of the phase coherence. Okay, it's always the same interference pattern. Huh? And, uh, and then uh, you can see that uh, now you would have a, a maximum here, zero, another maximum. So if we take only this line, you have a maximum, let's say here, another maximum, and this one. But since our lattice, those are experimental data, it's three-dimensional, you have also the other peak, okay, for each you know, interference in each 
dimension. The periodicity that you recover here, so what's the distance here, it's given by the lattice via the K vector of the lattice of the laser light. That's the periodicity in the reciprocal space, in momentum space. And, uh, but actually, if those uh, are incoherent uh, or if those are really localized particles, you would not get this interference pattern. What you get is a blob. There is no peak. There is no constructive interference. And this is what you see. So here you go from, uh, uh, let's say, Zero lattice is a normal uh, Bose-Einstein condensate. Then you start to ramp up the lattice, a superfluid interference, nice interference pattern, nice interference pattern. And then at some point, the interference pattern wash out, uh, and you have this type of blob. Okay? Now, when you see in the experiment something like this, you could also think that, okay, just particles were heated up by the lattice because now the power is very high of the lattice and there is no coherence, everything, just because of thermal, you are going out from the zero, let's say, macroscopic occupation of a quantum state, but more it's just thermal. But actually, that's not the case because if you ramp back down, you start from here, and then you ramp back down, you recover the interference pattern. The fact that you can ramp up and ramp down and get back the same interference pattern tells you that this is really not due to thermal, but it's really due to, uh, let's say, the Mott insulator phase, okay? In which, since there is a perfect uh, number function in one lattice side, there is, uh, let's say, no phase, uh, uh, let's say, um, those are complex conjugate. Spread in phase, uh, localization in atom number. Those are correlated by the Heisenberg principle. Now, in the may, for many, many years from, I mean, the first paper was in 2002. I mean, Marcus Greiner, which now is uh, one of the very leading person in the field, uh, was a, a young PhD student in doing this. Now he has his own fantastic group, just to give an example of, you know, was really some time ago. And, um, and the, the observable of this first quantum simulation example uh, was something which don't tell you anything about the single particle. Uh, so these are average observable. Okay, that's the interference pattern of many atoms, not one, many. So then this gave you access to, let's say, global observable, not local. Now, that's not what you want to have. You want to have local observable. You want to have Remy entropy. You want to have correlation. You want to be able to extract correlation locally. You want to study, let's say, be able to subdivide in sub- uh, uh, region uh, your system. And this then became, almost 10 years after, available with the new experimental technique. And this new experimental technique is the one of a, a quantum gas microscope. So with the quantum gas microscope, I can explain you later if there are questions, what you can do, you can really see each uh, uh, of the atom, so you, you might have the quantum gas and you can project uh, really each of the atom in a lattice side. So you have really the single atom visibility. In all this picture, the lattice is on, so you are pinning the position of the atom and you are looking. Uh, and so here, for example, that's the we one wedding cake uh, layer in this sense. We'll have this type of things. And, uh, but then, I mean, uh, mm, just, I mean, uh, as a curiosity for you, since uh, the topic of the, of the field, you get this type of system, uh, this type of image, and uh, kind of if the distance between the lattice side is big enough, uh, then you can really distinguish whether one lattice side was occupied and one was empty. No? But imagine that now these two lattice sides are very close. How can you distinguish? How can you say if the distance between the lattice side is smaller than the point spread function of the atom? How can you distinguish? And now, in one of the recent uh, trends uh, of the field is really to use, uh, let's say, this deep learning assisted classification to really, let's say, give an, uh, an image uh, which is not fully resolved, uh, can we use, uh, let's say, a protocol based on neural network to reconstruct uh, the initial uh, 
let's say, uh, system. And so actually this uh, seems to be really uh, very promising and many groups are picking up on this idea and reconstructing and, and uh, reconstructing the pattern. Okay, now I'll just give you okay, an example. I mean, this has allowed many things, this new technique, and now let me give you, for example, one uh, uh, example is really the direct observation of what was, a, a, let's say, uh, Eisenberg model. So to the creation of really, you know, in the spin degree of freedom, really the creation of patterns spinned up, spin up, spin up, spin out, that was really one of the macro phases uh, uh, that one wanted to observe. And this is from the group of uh, uh, Marcus Greiner. But of course, I mean, there is much more because on the one hand, you can use the quantum simulation to uh, shed new uh, light on problem that exists since a long time. But also, I mean, uh, all this new technique has allowed to see things which were not even predicted in, uh, in uh, theory, especially for the, uh, let's say, non-equilibrium uh, dynamics, uh, because there the prediction really goes very short. It's very difficult to... Uh, build up a model on non-equilibrium dynamics. Okay, this was one example, but then uh, the, the field have, uh, let's say, evolved, creating much more complex geometry, studying transport in the honeycomb, graphene type lattice, uh, or even not using uh, uh, one single species, but different single species where you have multi-component gas, or even, you know, having not a lattice, but put disorder on the lattice and study phenomena related to many body localization, phenomena related to Anderson localization, and, uh, and studying transport in a disorder potential. But all this study here have been done considering that the particle, yes, interact, but that the particle interact via this uh, billiard ball example that I told you, via just the contact interaction, this delta function. But this, as I show you also in the Hubbard model that we were considering, is an approximation. You are saying that just atoms, if they are in the same lattice side, are interacting, but if they are in two different, no. And that's not always true. Can we go beyond? Because we know that that's the relevant thing for electron. Okay, and so the, the last ingredient are the atoms. Indeed, I mean, if you say, okay, I want to use an uh, alkali atom with one valence electron, that's the, I mean, that's the interaction you can create, just the delta function, which I will call from now on contact, because they need to be in contact. And, uh, and okay, all these things have been really fantastic, uh, studied in lattice, in tweezer, all what I was showing you, but there is not too much a little bit more can be done with alkali. I will show you something. But we would like also to go, you know, a bit farther. And actually, the alkali are just one narrow part in the periodic table, but the periodic table is much bigger. Can we go to an isotropic medium, an isotropic atom? The first uh, step was to use not alkali, but alkali hurt. All this column, it's the second column of the periodic table, have two valence electrons. And these already open and, uh, let's say, unlock uh, other, you know, tunability. But there is even much more, and that's uh, where, uh, I mean, it's uh, more my expertise goes in, is to move to really atomic species which are highly anisotropy. Like, for example, this uh, strange object which I'm depicting here are the lanthanide, okay? And so I wa want to tell you a little bit uh, how to go from the Bose and fermi abbard model to the extended Bose and fermi abbard model using uh, a lanthanide atom. One question is, uh, how is with the question to know where I should stop? And then I can repeat later. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So now we have lanthanide. What does it mean? Orange is the core. So neutron, proton, and inner shell electron together. We don't care too much. And then all these black dots are the valence electron. Lanthanide have typically more than 10 valence electrons. Hmm? How do, and the valence electrons are really very interesting because two of them are kind of filling a, a spherical symmetric shell. So an S shell. But then there are all the other electrons which are in a highly anisotropic F shell. 
okay? So the typical uh, electronic configuration of lanthanide, it's a noble gas, which is typical xenon, and then you have something which is F shell with a given number of electrons, up to 14. With 14, the F shell is filled. And then there is a, so this is always 4F to something, okay? In the case of uh, this prosium atom, this something is 10, and for erbium, this something uh, is uh, 12. And then you have a 6 S square. The S shell is completely filled. The F shell has vacancy. Because of this strong anisotropy, many properties uh, for quantum physics uh, are emerging. So the first uh, uh, time people have used lanthanide in experiment was in the group of Benjamin Left, uh, and they used it as a lanthanide called dysprosium, and then it was my group in Innsbruck uh, uh, with erbium, and now we also produce the erbium dysprosium mix. So it was a kind of a very young, in some sense, system. And uh, one of the key points is that the vacancy in the F shell determine the magnetic moment. So I don't know if you ever asked yourself, what do, where do the magnetic moment of anything come from? Well, the magnetic moment, mu, is really a quantum number because it's uh, the Landé factor, j, multiplied uh, by the spin state. This j is a function of the quantum number of j, l, i, of all the quantum number of the atomic species. An isotropic shell has very large, uh, you know, L orbital, and so it means the magnetic moment is very large. You have lanthanide in your mobile phone. So alloy of lanthanide determines the vibration of uh, your mobile phone. Lanthanide are the most magnetic atom of the periodic table. That's it. Okay, there is nothing more magnetic that, than this. And the magnetism comes from the uh, vacancy in the F shell. If it's fully filled, the F shell, then no magnetic moment. That's it, erbium, zero magnetic moment. Then erbium, which, uh, I mean, uh, filled means 14. Erbium has only two left. It's very magnetic, but less magnetic than this prosium, which have four vacancy. Okay? And, uh, and since atoms have a very strong magnetic moment, uh, the consequence is that you don't have only the contact interaction, you have also the magnetic interaction. The magnetic interaction, now don't think about the billiard ball, but think about uh, two physical magnets, the one that you attach on your uh, fridge. Two physical magnets, you feel the force uh, of your magnet even before they touch. Not only this, uh, that you feel the force, but it's different whether it's pole, south pole, north pole, it's different, they can attract or repulse. Okay, so anisotropy, because it's depending on which direction you do things for attraction, anisotropy means depending on the angle, directional, is a directional interaction, and then its long range is going like one or r to the three, okay? And actually, these are, are so new and with so many new properties. I really like to show this graph that have been done by Tillman Fau. Uh, is, uh, I mean, uh, the physics was starting in 2011 with this prosium and uh, 2012 by us with the erbium. And for a while, few here, nobody really, I mean, there was, we were the only two sweet spot. I mean, we found many, many fantastic uh, new uh, results. And then, you know, no, that's how the situation is uh, in the coal gas experiment. Almost uh, every big group that I know have either an erbium or, or a dysprosium experiment. And, uh, and that's why uh, in identifying uh, the new uh, quant ultra-cold quantum technology for the future, lanthanide are one of the uh, big trends. Hmm? And there are few uh, to review. Let's say this is about the ultra-cold quantum technology, and this is a long review article explaining dipolar quantum gases. 
And uh, let me just uh, tell you that, okay, so we typically consider these two atoms because they have a very large magnetic moment, but that's not the only properties. Uh, we have more tools uh, that all come from the multi-electron nature. Okay, so one tool is that we have many atomic lines, really many, that we can study. So we can manipulate the atom with light and we can almost ad hoc decide whether we want that the light is very strong acting on the atom or very weak. This, this means that we have atomic transition which have a strength going from kind of six order of magnitude. So we can pick almost everything we want, okay? including, uh, oh, this is one, then the larger quantum number due to this anisotropy not only give you the magnetic properties, as I said, but also means uh, that this is a, a large spin system. In the ground state, erbium and dysprosium, since the number of spin state is 2j plus 1, can have, uh, you know, the, this is the fermionic one, uh, and this one has uh, 20 spins. So it's a large spin system. So you can go from really quantum, spin up, spin down, to the, if you would populate uh, all of them to the classical. You could study the quantum to classical transition in spin, for example. Or you can select a subset of spin and just work with these two or these two. And then uh, another important property is this transition here, which is at one kilo, one hertz. This is a clock type transition, interesting for metrology, interesting for precise addressability of any energy scale which is in the Earth. The small correction of the Hamiltonian you can catch, okay, you can probe. And actually this is a clock transition that we call orbital clock transition. Also interesting is that the wavelength is huge, is in the so-called telecom window. Okay, so that's the clock transition. And it's in this so-called telecom window. So it's very much here. It's very much uh, uh, interesting for application because if you have a two-level system emitting uh, at the telecom, then this telecom photon, you can put it in a fiber and create a quantum network. Okay, so that's because uh, telecom uh, wavelengths are the one you can easily transport in fiber. And so it's very relevant for communication entanglement, but also to study what is called cooperative phenomena. So the situation in which you have a discrete set of atoms, one after the other, which are a small spacing, but they emit at larger wavelengths. So you immediately imagine if you have antenna that they are very close to each other, all emitting at very large wavelengths, you can imagine, immediately think that there are cooperative effects coming, where they can organize between them to kind of all emit at the same time, all suppress the emission, but even you can, this atom can be a mirror for the light, can be completely reflective. You can use atom for uh, creating a mirror. And that's a bit unique uh, of the large wavelengths and the small lattice spacing. And, uh, you know, you can, uh, moreover, these atoms have many isotopes. You can do bosons, you can do fermions. Each of these is a little bit different molecular potential, so this phase shift is a little different. So you can also pick up the right scattering properties that you would like to have, and the polarizability, that it's what I promised to you for the polarizability for this alpha, the tensorial alpha for an isotropic media. Indeed, uh, you can just by changing uh, the polarization angle of your light, uh, make that the atom will feel a very different, uh, so this is, you know, you remember the cosine function we had, uh, that's the function. So you can also play with this anisotropy in the polarizability. And of course, you can use the clock transition as well to really manipulate the spin state, okay? And so typically, instead of having an incoherent uh, spin ensemble, I mean, we have now developed all a technique based on rabbi pulse uh, to really populate any spin state. Those are the bosons, and the bosons have 13 spin state, the fermions have 20 spin state, and, but we can really populate, uh, put all the atom in whatever spin, uh, uh, sub with whatever spin population that we want. It's totally deterministic thanks to the clock transition. 
And uh, I, but the also very interesting uh, and maybe most relevant for this talk is that now we have extended the lattice spin model or extended the lattice model. Because now, because the dipole-dipole interaction is stronger, you have interaction between uh, atom which are physically sitting in a, a different lattice site. And uh, I want just, uh, okay, this, the, the, the magnetic atom are not the only strongly long range interacting system. That's also important to say. There are also molecules can be even strongly, more strongly dipolar, but much more tougher to control. You can have Rydberg atom. Rydberg atom realizes a situation in which the, let's say, long-range interaction is so strong uh, that overwhelm all the other energy scale. Very interesting for many applications. We are in a situation in which we can create frustration with, between different uh, energies, competition of energy, competition of interaction, because those are several interactions. And this frustration, as I will show you later, will give you new phase of matter. Then ion. Coulomb interaction, this will be 1 over R. And then, of course, a light-induced interaction, so that's the 1 over R to the cube uh, dipole di electric dipole-dipole interaction. And I will, let's say, stop now before we go to this idea of having quantum simulation with high connectivity. I would take some questions, and then we go in the next part of the talk. <coughs> Thank you. Comment. Okay, so thanks. Uh, and uh, now the mic is on, so we can take questions. <laughs> when you shifted over to looking at the F shell and mentioned that the magnetization depended on the number of occupied electrons, and thus we could manipulate the magnetic moment by controlling this, in a practical setting, how does one do that, given that there are so many levels that you'd need to address? Are they all equally spaced? Do we need the same laser frequencies? Do you have to modulate the frequency of the laser with a broadband? Can you re, re sorry, the first part of your question was not. So you mentioned that we could control the magnetization of the lanthanides by. The magnetic moment or the magnetization? Uh, magnetic moment, sorry, that's my okay. bad. Okay, you can control the magnetic moment of the lanthanide um, yes and no, because this really depends on the properties of the atom. Dif as I, I told you, that erbium has a different magnetic moment uh, of this prosium. The way you can control is changing the spin state. All, every spin state has a different magnetic moment, but this goes by a step of one. You cannot really, I mean, it's... Uh, you can a little bit control the magnetic moment by rotating uh, the, quanti the, the magnetic field quantization axis, and then you can create time average potential. But typically, this is really determined by the innate uh, quantum number. They need it for the zoom. Um, the fact that uh, um, the wavelength of a single particle decreases with the mass does with affect the? the wavelength of a single particle uh, decreases with increasing mass. Uh, does affect the simulation of electronic systems with uh, atoms and molecules? No, I would not say so. What are you thinking about exactly? Nothing particular. Because you have also the temperature. Hmm. As a con so in the De you mean the De Broglie wavelength. Yeah, exactly. The De Broglie wavelength is controlled by the mass, and it's also controlled by uh, the temperature. So you can always, uh, you know, play with the temperature. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there more questions?
So I'm a bit confused about the, the temperature uh, that you just mentioned. So I imagine the experiment is very fast. So can you really say that the, that the system is uh, thermali thermalized? And um, how, what, 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 how do you know the temperature? I guess the system is pumping energy or you have some relaxation. I, I, don't, I don't understand the, the, temperature. the temperature part of the experiment. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, typically, um, okay, so you mean how we cool down and what is uh, the final state? So we cool down uh, in two steps. One is dramatic and one is soft. The dramatic part is really cooling down from, uh, I would say, Kelvin to micro Kelvin. And this is done with laser light, with so-called laser cooling. Uh, but this is then we arrive to micro Kelvin. We are not yet both condensed. Quantum degeneracy is not there. It's still a Boltzmann type of ensemble of particles. Let's forget about this, although it's very important because without it. Then what we do, in a way or the other, we trap the atom in an harmonic trap. Okay? And so in this harmonic trap, atoms are kind of, uh, you know, somehow everywhere. Okay? You have a Boltzmann ensemble. Okay? Then if I put the velocity and I put the function of the velocity, this is this type of function with the long Q, okay? Boltzmann distribution velocity. And then we have two or three different ways of removing a high energy atom. So basically we are cutting here all this atom, the atom at high velocity. Then what you have is a non-equilibrium truncated distribution. At this point, we wait. Collision, this is a contact interaction, scattering due to the contact interaction, are making the system re-thermalizing and spreading in the tree. And so from this, we get this. After thermalization. We cut again. Again, out of equilibrium, we wait. And again, and now this will become like this. At some point, we reach a critical temperature for Bose-Einstein condensate. The system undergo a phase transition, okay, from thermal to Bose condensed, which is not only saying I remove one more and I make this narrower, it's really changing the statistical distribution, going a phase transition in which there is a, the, an avalanche of this atom going all here. This avalanche is this phase transition. And at this point they go here, we kind of can wait a little bit more. Everything is thermalized, everything is a stationary state at equilibrium, feeling the lower energy level. This is a not correct what I said, uh, because that's a many, mean, mean field approach, mean field uh, picture, because all in the mean field, uh, you have all the atom in one state. Uh, so when people say a Bose-Einstein condensate is the macroscopic occupation at zero temperature, all atom in one state, that's a mean field definition. In reality, on top of this, you have the quantum fluctuation, so there is a probability to be in higher K. Nah? So it's a more, much more complex uh, ground, real ground state and bending the quantum fluctuation, the quantum, uh, yeah, the correlation and quantum fluctuation. <coughs> yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, you need to, because otherwise via Zoom uh, they cannot hear uh, without the microphone. Just two curiosities about this. Uh, what is the difference from the time scale of evolution uh, simulations in quantum uh, this, this type of system compared to real systems? 
difference. And another one is uh, how can I we can I we simulate an attractive interactions? Uh, how can we simulate sorry? attractive interactions local, for example, uh, like we see in an effective LTO models. Now, attractive interaction is easy. It's very easy in our in many way, even with the contact one, because you have a scattering lens. But I've not told you the sign. This can be, so uh, typically this is used uh, with the sign plus, uh, which means uh, repulsive interaction. But since we can tune uh, the value of the scattering lens with magnetic field, we can also have negative scattering lens. This make uh, attractive contact interaction. This have been also done in the experiment with cold atoms. So this is easy. The local interaction. So <coughs> For example, inter-site interactions is the same, the same way to... The inter-site interaction, it's uh, uh, with contact that you cannot have. No, is what we said. I mean, uh, we have all interaction because it's short range uh, when they are in the same lattice site. With dipole-dipole interaction, yes, you can have interaction between different lattice sites. And now, like magnet, uh, this can be repulsive or attractive depending on the orientation of the dipole moment. So if I put my atom in this, in the lattice side and two different well attractive, this is attractive interaction between lattice wells. So we can do it by changing uh, the angle. The time scale, that is the case. Then in the first part of your question, the time scale, uh, so there is a one uh, time scale is the lifetime of the system. And then there is another time scale uh, which is set by the interaction. So in the many body system, uh, typically you want to have many body because the interesting dynamics and phenomenology is embedded in the interaction. So the question is, and then you can define uh, what it's called an interaction time. Okay, so what's the time needed uh, to make one interaction? Okay, and this interaction time can uh, really depend on the strength of the interaction. And since you can almost go to the unitary regime where the scattering lens is infinite, you can make this interaction time extremely fast. <coughs> so you can have many, many cycles of interaction time. With the dipole, with the contact interaction, with the dipole interaction, both in the Rydberg system uh, that now are used as a platform for quantum, uh, let's say, information, uh, computation slash simulation, let's say, uh, the, the typical interaction time of the current uh, Rydberg system, which have a problem, I mean, I don't know if I have time to tell you this problem, is about, you know, 10 to 15 interaction time, let's say 20. 20 interaction time, 15, let's say. Hard to, you know, give you a precise number. Those are the interaction time. So where you can make an operation. But then you have to tell, okay, I want to make an operation, but I want still to make this operation with, uh, uh, let's say, an error on the operation very low. So it's, the, it's a little bit uh, fluffy how you define interaction time. Interaction time without error can be just few. Interaction time in general where you allow for the fidelity to go down can be higher. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, thank Francesca once more. And uh, okay, we go.